Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part three of our video series looking at the lab exercise Paleozoic Orogenies of North America. So now we're going to move on to the Lisbon Falls South Quadrangle from Maine. So if we look, we have the map over here on the right and the map itself consists of a sequence of Ordovician and Silurian gneisses with lesser schists, rare marbles and also some amphibolites. So if we look at the map, we can see we have a letter code starting with SO for Silurian Ordovician. We have the same thing here. And then we have a sequence of uh, letter codes beginning with O down here in the southeast corner, which are Ordovician in age. We can also see that the sequence has been deformed. And we know this deformation has taken place because the Ordovician and Silurian rocks have become tilted. And this means that the metamorphic rocks show a southeasterly dip at an angle of between about 45 and 55 degrees. Now, we can also see that these Ordovician age rocks down here in the southeastern corner have been deformed. And this has led to the formation of an antiform. However, it's relatively poorly defined. So even though the map itself doesn't really show a, a whole lot going on, we know that deformation has taken place because the metamorphic rocks have been tilted and we have a portion of an antiform located in the southeastern corner once again telling us that this sequence has been deformed. Now within the area we can also see we have uh, a couple of other different rocks. We have these letter codes starting with CD here and here. So these are Devonian and Carboniferous aged rocks and these are granites. Down here in the southeastern corner, we also have uh, the rock with the letter code PG. This is a Permian age granite as well. So you can see that we clearly have two distinct pulses of granite intrusion, one dating to the Devonian and Carboniferous and one dating to the Permian. So these granites that have intruded these Ordovician to Silurian age rocks, uh, as I said, are Devonian to early Carboniferous in age and Permian. Now, the interesting thing about these granites is that their composition indicates that they were not formed due to subduction. Instead, they appear to have been formed by deep burial, which would suggest that what we could be looking at is a continent-continent collision. So in a continent-continent collision, obviously, we have these two pieces of continental crust smashing into each other. And this can lead to portions of the continental crust being pushed down uh, into higher pressure and higher temperature conditions. And if the temperature regime is suitable, that can lead to the continental crust beginning to melt, forming felsic magmas. And so the geochemistry of the granites that we can see in this map area would suggest that this is the case. So we're not looking at an ocean continent related convergence situation. Instead, this map area would begin to suggest that we are looking at the results of a continent continent collision. OK, so question one, which Paleozoic periods are not represented on the map? So if you remember, the periods of the Paleozoic are the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian. And of course, the Carboniferous is split into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. So which of those are missing from the map area? Question two, why are the missing pro, uh, Paleozoic rocks not present? So try and come up with an explanation as to why they're not within the map area. Question three. Based on the granites present in the map, how many orogenies have affected the area? So remember, the presence of these granites are highly suggestive of a uh, compressive orogenic event. But you don't just have one age of granite. So what would that suggest about how many times this area has been affected by orogenic processes? Question four. When were the metamorphic rocks deformed? And so, as previously mentioned, we know that down here in the southeastern corner, we have a sequence of Ordovician age rocks that have been formed into a poorly defined antiform. And we also know that these Silurian and Ordovician aged metamorphic rocks have also been tilted as well. So we know that this entire sequence of metamorphic rocks has been deformed. So what would that suggest? about the age of the deformation event that actually did this deformation. 
Okay, so the next map is going to be the area of the uh, Susquehanna River Valley of Pennsylvania. So we can see the map over here on the right. And straight away, you can quite clearly pick out that there is definitely an anticline or a syncline in this map area. You can see that it's orientated approximately like so, and you can see that it's clearly closing as you move towards the southwest corner of the map. Now, whether it's an anticline or a syncline, uh, you'll have to work that out for yourself, but I would very strongly advise you to look at the ages of the rocks that make up this anticline or syncline. Remember, anticlines will have the oldest rocks in the core and, sync and synclines will have the youngest rocks in the core. So if you look at the layers of rock here, you can see that we're starting with letter codes beginning with S, so Silurian, and that's progressing to letter codes in the core that start with P, so Permian. So I think that's going to give you some idea about the age of these rocks. So, okay, so the uh, Susquehanna River Valley in Pennsylvania map, um, it clearly shows that this area does not have any igneous bodies within it, but there are some relatively sparse north-south trending late Triassic to early Jurassic diabase dikes. Uh, so once again, these mafic magmas are typically associated with divergent tectonism, the areas being extended, it's being stretched. And you will also notice that late Triassic to early Jurassic uh, for dike formation is an age range that has come up in the previous maps as well. So that would suggest that what we're seeing here is not just a localized thing. This is actually something that's been happening along a very large portion of uh, the modern day east coast of North America. Okay, in terms of the rocks themselves, they have not been metamorphosed. So what we've got is we've got a sequence of sedimentary rocks. So if we come down here, you can see in this table, it covers the whole range of uh, rocks present, uh, going from the Silurian. So down here, we've got sandstones and shells. We have a whole range of mudstones, some limestones. And I've just noticed that I made a mistake earlier when I referred to PP as Pennsylvanian, uh, Permian, sorry. It is in fact Pennsylvanian age. My apology for that mistake. So, okay. So let's look at the questions associated with this particular map. So what does the lack of felsic and e intermediate igneous rocks and metamorphism suggest about the likely location of this area relative to the highlands? Remember, metamorphic grades and the amount of intrusions is going to be at their highest the closer you are to your highlands, to your mountain range. So the fact that this map is not metamorphosed and it is not full of intrusions would strongly suggest that it is, you can answer the rest of that question. Question two, which post Ordovician Paleozoic periods are missing from the map area provide an explanation? So once again, look at the periods of the Paleozoic, which ones are not represented in this map area? Remember, you are looking at those which occur after the Ordovician. And once again, please provide an explanation as to why they are not present in the map area. Question three, using figure 1610, which is this figure right here, produce a cross section along the uh, along the line between A and A prime. So by now you've done a few cross sections, you know what you're doing, you're going to line your piece of paper along this line of section, you're going to mark off wherever a boundary occurs, and you are going to mark it onto the topographic profile below. And of course, you can see that you have some dip and strike symbols giving you uh, information about the dip and dip direction for layers of rock. And once again, I would remind you that even though these layers down here do not have dip and strike information associated with them, you know that they must run parallel to the layers of rock that do have dip and strike information. So that means you can apply this dip and strike information to these layers down here, even though they do not have it. Okay, so question four, what structure is present in your cross section? Well, it's an antiform or a synform. You can work that out. Uh, question five, 
Based on the orientation of the structure that you identified in question four, what was the orientation of the compressive stress that formed it? So if we come back up here, we can quite clearly see that our anticline or syncline is orientated in this direction, moving from approximately northeast to southwest. And if you remember, the compressive stress that formed it will have been at 90 degrees to this orientation. So that should hopefully help you answer that question. So on to question six. Rivers typically, when they move across sedimentary trains, will preferentially erode the weakest layer of rock to form a valley. Kind of makes sense. As the river's moving across an area, it will cross several layers of rock, but typically it will find one layer of rock that's the most easily eroded, at which point it will start exploiting just that layer of rock and it will use that layer of rock as essentially a path of least resistance, the easiest route that the river can take. Now, when we look at the uh, Susquehanna River uh, within the map area, you can see it coming down like so. And straight away, you will notice that it does not exploit just one layer of rock. In fact, it cuts across the entire sequence. So it's not preferentially exploiting one layer. So the question becomes, why is this? Well, let's think about this area. So this area we know was affected extensively by the Alleghenian uh, orogeny, and this will have produced a very large mountain range in this area, and that may go some way to explaining the fact that we have this massive anticline or syncline in the southern portion of our map area. However, later on, as with all of these mountain ranges and all the mountain ranges we have today, they will eventually be eroded away to nothing. The area will be completely flat. And so if you imagine a situation where the area was completely eroded away and then a river starts cutting through that flat plain, what path is the river going to take? All right. So think about what's happened to the topography and how that might just encourage the river just to go wherever it wants rather than preferentially eroding just one layer of rock. On to question seven. The diabase dikes that are present in the map area, you can see them right here. There's one right there, and we have another one right here. Um, what does this tell us about the age of the dikes? So to start with, when you look at these dikes, what layers of rock are they cutting across? So when you look at them, based on the principle of cross-cutting relationships, are these dikes younger? than the deformed sedimentary rocks? Were they formed during the deformation of the sedimentary rocks? Or are they older than the deformation of the sedimentary rocks? And please provide the principle of relative dating that allows you to work that out. Then moving on to question eight, when in the Paleozoic were the sedimentary rocks in figure 16.9 deformed? And what evidence to, supports your hypothesis? Okay, so remember, the rocks in question can only be deformed if they were present before deformation occurred. Another thing that I would point out is that when deformation occurs, you typically get uplift of the terrain, and that will lead to layers of rock being eroded. So post-Pennsylvanian aged rocks appear to be missing from this map area. That's probably a pretty good hint about when this deformation occurred because those post-Pennsylvanian age rocks were pushed up in elevated terrain and they were eroded away. So that's giving you information about when the orogenic event possibly occurred. On to question nine. Uh, were the Triassic dikes caused by the orogeny that deformed the sedimentary rocks? Yes or no? So... You can probably work that out by now because we've discussed what kind of tectonic event forms anticlines and or synclines and what type of te tectonic event leads to the emplacement of mafic dikes. The next question is what event could have caused the emplacement of these diabase mafic dikes? So you can uh, look on the internet or you can review your class notes. Remember, please take a second and look at the, uh, the lecture videos and that will give you some indications of the type of events that can lead to the formation or emplacement of mafic intrusives. 
Uh, I could possibly suggest that you might want to go and revisit the uh, Precambrian Geology of North America lab because there is a certain event which creates a very noticeable horseshoe-shaped feature on the geologic map of North America that may give you some idea of the type of event that could lead to the emplacement of these diabase dikes. Okay, so that's it for this particular lab exercise. Thank you for taking the time to watch these videos and have a good day.